Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. It gives you everything you need in one place for free, which you can use right from your phone or computer. Creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast so it sounds great. They'll even distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. You can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Where do you place it, right? Um, you know, you start reading scientific discoveries of, you know, human hominoids existing 200,000 years ago. Uh, you got loose. <laughs> Awesome, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Is What It Is podcast. I am your host, Cody Kelly. Look, I'm super excited. This is a new season, even though it seems like we just had this blizzard here in Chicago, but it's a new season, new year. We have some amazing guests. But if you want to keep seeing amazing influencers, amazing leaders like Dr. Hugh Ross, who I have on today, you got to do a couple things. Connect with me on Instagram at CVMK33. Also, follow the business page at CVMK underscore global. Go to the website, man, where all your best fitness, apparel, and sports supplements are at cvmkglobal.store. Subscribe to the YouTube page at CV Space K. That is Cody Vernon Space Kelly, where all content is seen, heard, and felt. I have an amazing episode with an amazing guest. I mean, I have a real doctor on here, uh, an astrophysicist, <laughs> who we're going to get into it with and really discuss the scientific evidence for Christianity because it seems like a play on words. Science, Christianity, seems like they don't even fit. So I really want to unpack this because I think inquiring minds want to know. Obviously, we want to have an intelligent faith, not just an emotional one. So with that being said, Dr. Ross, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thank you. Cool, cool. Well, look, let me read your bio because this bio is, is LinkedIn approved. This is amazing. Uh, astrophysicist Hugh Ross is the founder and president of Reasons to Believe, an organization that researches and communicates how discoveries about nature harmonize with the words of the Bible. That's interesting how it's phrased, harmonize with the words. His books include Weathering Climate Change, The Creator and the Cosmos, and The Improbable Planet. So let's start here. Uh, <laughs> science and Christianity have been strange bedfellows. At one time, it seemed like the science of faith was dictating the science or dictating natural science. And then you, we hit a wave in the enlightenment period where it seems like uh, everything was antagonistic toward the word of God that, you know, science had its part and faith had its part. Uh, obviously, I'm a graduate of uh, Loyola University. I forgot which Pope said it, but I believe it's Pope John. How oh, is it Paul the... Is it the first? It's one of them. I'm bad at it. Please don't get me, y'all. Please out there. <laughs> Do not get me for this. But he said, science explains the how, and the Bible explains the why. And I always thought that quote was amazing. Uh, I thought that was a great tie-up. Uh, but what it did not do, it didn't really answer the responsibility that each one plays and how accurate both really are and that they're really not, you know, enemies i think the apostle paul writes that thing that is so falsely called science right so with that said uh dr ross you're an astrophysicist how has that first of all that's amazing but how has that led you to faith well i got interested in astronomy when i was seven years of age uh, from the age of seven onwards i was reading three to five books on astronomy and physics every week I mean, I was just captivated by the subject. And every year growing up, I would study a different subdiscipline of astronomy. And uh, when I was uh, 16, I studied cosmology. That's the science of the origin and history of the universe. And uh, that was a time when uh, astronomers were saying, is it a steady state? Is it an oscillating universe? Is it a Big Bang universe? Uh, but as I studied it, I realized 
of all the different models out there, the Big Bang was fitting the observations. And if it's Big Bang, that means the universe has a beginning. If it has a beginning, there must be a cosmic beginner. Now, I was born, raised, and educated in Canada. I really didn't know any serious Christians growing up. Uh, but, uh, you know, I began to look uh, for this cosmic beginner. And uh, I didn't know where to look. And I started looking for him in the writings of the great philosophers, particularly Immanuel Kant and Rene Descartes, but yeah. discovered they didn't have the correct concepts of space and time. And then I began to look at the holy books that undergird the world's religions. And for some reason, I left the Bible to the very end. Uh, but I eventually did pick up a Bible and began to go through it. And uh, it was a Gideon Bible. I was given a Bible in my public school. Yeah. I began to go through this Gideon Bible. And uh, I began by looking at the Genesis creation text. And I said, wow, this follows the scientific method. Now, I was naive. I wasn't aware at that time that the scientific method comes from the pages of the Bible. It comes from Reformation theology. Uh, I, I didn't discover that until nine years later. But as I went through that, I realized, hey, all the events in Genesis 1 are in the correct chronological sequence, and they're all correctly described. So this is fitting the record of nature. This is actually predicting things are way beyond the science of the author of the text. And I spent 18 months studying the Bible one to two hours a day, looking for a place where I could prove a scientific or historical error. I was unable to do that, but I found hundreds of places where the Bible accurately predicted either future historical events or future scientific discoveries. And it was at age 19, I signed my name in the back of a Gideon Bible, committing my life to Jesus Christ. But it wasn't until I arrived on the Caltech campus, after I finished my doctoral degree, that I met people who are serious followers of Jesus Christ. They helped me find a Bible-believing church. And after I had started attending that church for seven months, they wound up putting me on their pastoral staff uh, because they thought, hey, uh, they could use me to train people how to use the book of nature to bring people to the book of scripture and into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it was that church sandwiched between Caltech and the Jump Propulsion Laboratory uh, that helped me launch Reasons to Believe uh, 36 years ago. Uh, is it safe to say that you're smarter uh, from an, <laughs> a scientific standpoint than most clergy? And what I mean by that, I don't mean that in an offensive way. I'm just saying, you know, I grew up obviously in the church, uh, grew up uh, in a uh, uh, liturgical home, uh, grandson of a prominent bishop in a Pentecostal church. Um, so, you know, I understand it. And he, he himself, very educated man, um, he was actually a chemist. Um, and one of the things that attracted me to faith is that he never dumbed down the scriptures and he caught flack for that. Right. Uh, especially in the time that he was presenting it, you know, he didn't shy away uh, from explaining natural phenomenons and, and, and things of that nature. But it seems like you have to pick a side now. It seems like faith has become, and even science has become politicized, right? And to the point that, you know, if you stand up in an average, let's say, Bible-believing church and say, you know, like, it coincides with the Big Bang Theory that there is overlap in uh, this uh, explosion that started everything was, you know, when God said, let there be. Um, and that, you know, cellular function and atomic splitting and all that just kind of occurred. You might turn off the audience that caters toward uh, the right, right? <laughs> you might lose your Sunday school audience is what I'm trying to say. How have you navigated th that space because i'm sure like as a as a scientist you know you're you're kind of looked as the boogeyman at church how do you navigate the space well i mean you said it earlier that uh, science and the bible are not enemies 
their allies. So I show them how they're allies. I mean, what you mentioned about the Big Bang, a lot of lay people in church really don't understand uh, what Big Bang creation is all about. They don't realize it's a creation model. Yeah. So I explained to them, hey, it's called the creation model uh, by astrophysicists because it not only points to a beginning of the universe, it points to a beginning of space and time itself. And lots of holy books talk about a beginning of the universe. What's unique to the Bible, it says that the moment that God created the universe, he also created space and time. Mm -hmm. And we now have what's called the space-time theorems that prove that, in fact, that's exactly what happened. And so, and then actually to take him through the Bible and say, notice how often the Bible speaks about a beginning to the universe right. that includes a beginning of space and time. It tells us that the laws of physics are constant. They have not changed. Just as God is immutable, the laws of physics are immutable. How uh, one of those laws is a pervasive law of decay, what the Bible sometimes calls a law of corruption. Uh, but as you look at Ecclesiastes, it's referring to the thermodynamic laws. And the Bible also says in 11 places that God created the universe with a property of expansion. God stretches out the heavens. Right. And when it talks about stretching it out, it refers to it in all three Hebrew verb forms. And those are the four fundamental features of Big Bang cosmology. A beginning, constant laws of physics, a pervasive law of decay, uh, and the universe expands. And I found that even people who only have a junior high background in science know that any system that expands will get colder and colder as it expands. And so frequently I'll show audiences, here is the biblically predicted cooling curve for the universe. And here are actual measurements we astronomers have made of the past temperature of the universe. And you see it's a perfect fit. So there you see the alliance or taking them through Genesis 1, as we just discussed, sure. and showing them if you follow the biblical testing method, sure. don't interpret and to establish the frame of reference and the initial conditions, which is stated in Genesis 1, 2. You get a sequence of events and it fits the established scientific record perfectly. And the description of the events likewise fit the established scientific record. And clearly, this is way beyond the science of the biblical authors. When I saw that in the biblical text, I said, the only explanation, this book must be inspired by the one that did the deed. Hmm. I like that. I like that. This book must be inspired. So the, the hiccup I uh, run into is um, not after Genesis 1. So you, do, you get into Genesis 2. And then we start talking about the Edenic fall, right? And at what point does that happen? How can you chronologically order human history? Uh, because where do you place it, right? Um, you know, you start reading scientific discoveries of, you know, human hominoids existing 200,000 years ago. Uh, you got Lucy and, you know, a few others that, you know, at least, you know, a couple hundred thousand years of age. And, uh, I think um, Ar Ar Aristotelian Christianity <laughs> has us at about 7,000 years, you know, but when you, you know, the science has us longer than that. Uh, and it's hard because, you know, where do you place all this? Where do you place the story of Noah? All right. Um, and even though Noah or this great flood uh, is in every basically uh, uh, ecosystem, and, and culture at the time, you know, it's mentioned in Mesopotamian culture and religion. It's mentioned in the Quran. It's, it's yeah. mentioned in a lot of different places, different right? Cultures. Right. Yeah. And so it's it's obvious that this uh, cataclysmic event has happened. The real question is when, right? Like, and that's when everybody's always kind of had this failing. So where, how old do you place the earth? Like, at what point do you say mankind or humanity appeared at this time? What up, everybody? It's your boy, Season K33, with another workout. It's going to be a summer in a few weeks' time. And I don't want you to miss out on the body and the life you could be having. How do you start? 
pre workout, super power, the best pre workout on the market. Get your stay at www.cdkgo.com. You might need a little help. Everybody need a little help. <laughs> Got a formula design for you guys. Just for you, batter up. Get it today. www.cdmkglobal.store. Well, as far as the Earth goes, that's 4.5662 billion years ago. And the error bar is plus or minus 0. 0.0001 billion. We know it to five decimal places. Right. I explain why I, in my book, A Matter of Days. But where humanity fits in that is relatively recent. Now, you're mentioning the 200,000 years. The truth is our best scientific dates for the origin of humanity uh, are not based on radiometric dates. Uh, it's in a region where we don't have a radiometric dating tool. So we have to appeal to things like thermal luminescence and optical luminescence, which have huge systematic effects. Mm -hmm. And so truthfully, the best scientific date for the origin of humanity is 150,000 years ago, plus or minus 150,000 years. <laughs> So, and often you'll hear scientists saying 300,000 years ago, right. he's giving you the edge of the error bar, not the middle of the error bar. And the error bar is huge. Now, I think you get a slightly more accurate date from looking at Genesis chapter 2. Yeah. Because Genesis 2 tells us that God created Adam and Eve when there were four rivers coming together in the Garden of Eden. Right. It names the rivers, and it tells you where each one of them flows from. So we can easily identify them. So, uh, you know, you got the Gihon uh, coming out of the uh, uh, mountains of Cush. Right. And you got the, yeah, the Gihon, the, uh, and then you got a, a river coming out of the mountains of Havilah. Havilah, yeah. Uh, and then you got the uh, Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Yep. Um, and... Two of those rivers are flowing today, mainly because they have ice and snow to feed them. Uh, what we see with the Gihon, the Pishon, is that they were flowing. They're not flowing anymore because the mountains they flow from no longer have ice and snow. But they did during the last ice age. And uh, moreover, where they come together is now 200 feet below sea level. They wow. come together and what is now the southeastern portion of the Persian Gulf. But during the last ice age, that would have been above sea level. Because during the last ice age, sea levels were 250 to 390 feet lower. So sometime during the last ice age, God created Adam and Eve. And that gives you a date range of 15,000 to 130,000 years ago. Still not incredibly accurate, but it's better right. than the scientific date. I like that. I and I I can actually accept that and and argue. I, to me, that's an intelligent reasoning of faith, right? Like based on both supported evidence of science and based on what we know from the scriptures, this is probably when all this occurred, which would make a lot of sense. Um, because you know, I have no, I have literally the story of Noah, you know, fifteen to twenty thousand BC. You know, <laughs> like, like at least, you know, like it just, it just doesn't to me, it doesn't fit in, you know, in like three thousand well, BC or five. It's 000. interesting because when you look at Genesis chapter eight, mm -hmm. it says it took a little more than a year for all the flood waters to recede. Yeah. Well, for it to take that long, uh, you would need a lot of melting snow and ice. And you're only going to get that during an ice age. During an ice so age. yes, I think Noah's flood also occurred sometime during the last ice age. Now, where we do have a good radiometric date is for when we see this aggressive migration of humanity from one locale into all the regions of the world. That's around 40 to 45,000 years ago. So Noah's flood would take place sometime previous uh, to that event. Because that's what you see in Genesis 11 and 10, is that we have God scattering humanity over all the land masses of the earth. That's true. That's true. That, that, that's true. And that's profound. So, you know, obviously, and, you know, there was this gap, 
um, there's this there's the gap of evangelizing and then having something that could stand in the halls of academia. Um, you know, it's it's I know why the, the tension exists, but to me it's unwarranted because it's still a matter of faith. Like even if you chose not to believe it, like you should at least acknowledge that this that it exists, right? And that it is a frame of thought. Um, what I think is occurring now, you, you know, you, there's Christian movies like God's not dead one, two and three, I think, or whatever, how many they've done, uh, and all this stuff, you know, and it's, it, and it's kind of around the same essence, you know, trying to, uh, explain away God or that, you know, there's no way that a, you know, benevolent creator could create this, even though the more, you know, it seems like life goes on and you better hope that there is right. Hey, you know, so. But for you, you know, what drove you to create? Because this is, you know, you, you're kind of a unique hybrid, right? Like, you know, when you think of the, uh, what I would call titans of faith, right? You think of the, the T.D. Jakes of the world, the Billy Grahams of the world, the, you know, uh, Kenneth Copeland's and, you know, uh, Jesse Duplan, all, all, the, all these names, Mike Ty, all these, all these million Instagram followers or whatnot, None of them, uh, and it's not a slight, it's just that's not what their ministry is. And they're very intelligent, very quick, very spirit-led and filled. But the science of it, they can't really walk it. Jakes is probably the best at walking the science of it out, right? Uh, But as far as astrophysicists, because none of them are, right? Like, that's your lane. Why? I think it needs to be everybody's lane. Okay. You know, when I read the Bible, uh, particularly you see this in Psalm 19, uh, and you see it in Psalm 119, God calls every human being to study the scriptures, to study yeah. the book of scripture. Yeah. But he also commands us to study his second book, the book of nature. And so if you're a follower of God, you need to be studying both books. And I can tell you as one who has, it's a lot of fun. So I tell people in the church, you do not want to leave this to the professionals. Don't just let your pastor be the one that's studying the book of scripture. You need to do it too. And don't just let these professional scientists be the ones to study the book of nature. We all need to study the book of nature. And we need to see how the two books cooperate one another and support one another. Yeah. And just see the glory of God being manifested and both the book of scripture and the book of nature. That's what puts a thrill in my heart, is just seeing that. And I want every Christian to experience that and say, hey, I know you think science is tough. I know you think theology is tough, but this is something God wants each of us to do. And it's a way we can draw close to him and really have that intimate relationship with him. So go for it. That's true, that's true. And that, that brings me up another point. I why why do you think it's so hard for believers to unite, right? And I get it. You know, the Bible says that you know Satan is an accuser of the brethren, right? Like, hey, but it's 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 um it's like it's like we wage theological war within you know in house, you know. So when you're trying to witness and win, you know, uh, the world to this amazing Savior in Jesus. They might look at us like, well, you guys don't get along. You guys don't agree. You know, you're you know. on science faith issues. That seems to be where Christians vilify one another the most is yeah. on science faith issues. Yeah. But you know, the Bible tells us uh, that Satan's on a mission to divide us. So we shouldn't uh, be surprised that this is going on. But I really like what I see in 2 Corinthians 5, where Paul tells us, God has called us to be ambassadors for peace. Hmm. We are to encourage people that are not yet believers to make their peace with God. But how are they going to be willing to trust us to help them make peace with God if we Christians cannot make peace with one another? So Hmm. as I tell people who disagree with me on science faith issues, you know, it's good that there's disagreements. This is how we can learn from one another but it's how we disagree. I mean, Jesus was the one that said, they'll know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And so it's important 
that we love Christians who take a different position than we do or interpret things differently than we do. And if unbelievers can see us graciously and lovingly engaging one another in our differences, they're going to be motivated to trust us to help them with their differences with our faith. But if we're just fighting one another all the time and vilifying, attacking one another all the time, they're going to say, I don't want to get within 10 feet of a Christian. Keep them away from me. So I tell my friends who disagree with me, we are on stage. We are being watched. And so just be cognizant of the fact that there are people observing how we treat one another. That's true. That's true. Dr. Raj, you have been amazing. I know we're running out of time. I got one more question for you. Um, the scientific evidence of a creator. I mean, we, I know we've hit upon it, but, you know, to an agnostic, to an atheist, you know, like if they say, I know ice exists because I can hold it in my hand. Right? This is ice, right? I know that paper exists because I can hold it in my hand. What is the evidence for God? Well, they're holding ice in their hands, I still will tell them. There's no way you're going to be able to live on a planet that's got water in vapor, water is liquid, and water is frozen. You know what? We need water in all three forms for advanced life to exist here. Let me share with you a few minutes just how much fine-tuning is necessary to get a planet in which you have those three forms of water existing in the right proportions and the right amounts. I kind of do that in an improbable planet. And I found that people who are not believers, who may be really offended at the idea that there's a God, they like to listen to that stuff. And so over the years, I've written many books basically making that point. The fine tuning we see in the universe, Earth and Earth's life, points to a God who's personal, and who has a desire to bring billions of human beings to redeem them uh, from their sin and evil. That's where I see the greatest fine-tuning evidence. It's one thing to fine-tune the universe to get a bacterium, sure. quite another to get a universe where you have humans. But it really takes an extraordinary fine-tuning to get a universe where billions of us can be redeemed from our sin and evil. I like it. I like it. Well, this is an amazing episode featuring an amazing thought leader, uh, faith leader, science leader. And that's 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 hard to put all three together, um, really discussing the scientific evidence for Christianity. Dr. Ross, where can the people reach out to you? Where can they connect with you? Where can they support you and, and buy your books and stuff? Well, reasons.org, you'll find tens of thousands of articles on science faith issues there. And I've written 21 books. People can get a free chapter of one of my books by going to reasons.org slash Ross. Awesome. Guys, go to reasons.org, buy his books, educate yourself. You know, it's one thing to have a love for God. It's another thing to be able to intellectually communicate that love for God. <laughs> right? Uh, because what you don't want to do, you don't want, you don't want, it's like I said this. It's like saying, I love my wife. I love my wife. How? I love my wife. I love my wife. All right. Like, no explanation, no doing, no thought leadership, nothing of the nature. And that's why you need this because we all have to get better. We all have to do better. We all have to research and learn for ourselves. And we have to draw closer to Christ. And the great thing is God has provided us leaders like Dr. Ross, gifts in the world that we can draw closer to him by the works that he does through them. If you want to keep seeing amazing influencers, amazing just people like Dr. Ross, you know what you got to do. Connect with your man on Instagram at CVMK33. Also, the business page, CVMK underscore global. Go to the website, www.cvmkglobal.store. We're everywhere. Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Anchor, wherever you listen to podcasts, we are there. And subscribe to the YouTube page at CV Space K. Until next time, guys. Thanks.